How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Seth Julian. Welcome to tonight's seg uh, presentation titled Oil and Gas Geonomics, Geoeconomics. Please indicate on the uh, question and answer area if you can hear my voice and see the opening slide, and uh, then we'll start uh, straight away. Hello, Billy. Great. Good to see you and welcome. Harry. Ogareth, Oki, oh, Oki, good to see you again. Great, all good, everybody's in, that's good enough for me. Great, here we go. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have to, well, first let me say I'm your host, Seth Julian, I'm the Chief uh, Global Strategist here at Alvexo Trading, and I have a small apology to, or, or your forgiveness to ask. I have been very busy, we're planning for a, uh, uh, we're going to the uh, London Investor Show on uh, Saturday, and we're doing a lot of preparatory work, and therefore, this presentation is not the one I wanted. It uh, deals primarily with oil. I'll be able to adjust it as we go, but suffice it to say that um, the presentation itself is not exactly what I wanted to do. And therefore, can you raise the volume, please? I doubt that. Um, How about now? It was I, apparently I, the thing went into mute. How's how is it now, everybody? Okay. Yes, we're supposed to hear the presenter and. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So you missed everything up till now. All right, no problem. Back normal. All right, I don't know where I left off, so I'll, I'll just repeat a little bit. And uh, the, let me just remind you that the only protocol we have in the in the room is to please ask uh, questions. As they come up, so we can have uh, as close to a dialogue as possible, and uh, it's much more interesting for all of us. My name is Seth Julian. I'm the uh, chief global strategist here at Alvexo, and I've been trading in the capital markets for 51 years now. I'm 64 years old. I have uh, advanced training in um, uh, political economy, international trade, and business management. I worked on, started my career on Wall Street many, many years ago at an outfit called Bankers Trust Company, and uh, have worked at a number of uh, major brokerage houses around the world. And uh, and I've been at uh, Alvexo Trading now for a number of years, many years. Um, um, I think that's all we really need to say. Let's talk about oil geoeconomics, and and we'll talk about gas as well. Um, please, again, I ask you to post your questions in real time so we can see them and we can uh, all be involved in a dialogue, as much of a dialogue as possible. Now then. This map pretty much tells us everything we need to know about the world of oil and less so about gas. I'll come to gas in a moment, but still, notice that we focus on the Middle East, and, and, and this map is, is, is not uh, coincidental. This is a difficult map to find because it involves the Middle East. It's got China, Russia, all of the Caspian Basin, the Black Sea, and not to mention, this is where there's a lot of uh, misery happening now in, in the Ukraine. Um, and you'll notice these lines, these are pipelines, these are supply routes of oil and gas. And so they flow through a very, very sensitive area. And that's what we mean by geoeconomics, economics that is uh, related to geography. 
And when we talk about hydrocarbons, it's a geoeconomic story by far. And um, and so let's let's proceed. Now, I do want to emphasize this presentation was original. I don't know if I, I said this before when I was muted out. Um, I, I wanted to, I, I apologize to you and I'll, let me apologize again if you didn't hear. We've been busy preparing for the uh, London Investor Show uh, in uh, this uh, weekend. And um, therefore I have not gotten to really updating this the way I wanted to and I apologize for that. We will speak obviously about gas and the, and the political geopolitics of gas right now, the geoeconomics of gas. But there are some parts of this thing that I'm going to skip over or go rather quickly because it really does focus on oil. The oil is sourced from some of the most politically risky places in the world, right? Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iraq. These places are, are, are fragile, like, like, like houses of cards. There's a threat. We don't see this in the press, of course, but there's a threat against the Saudi Arabians probably three times a month. There's a lot of rivalry here. Um, because the Saudis are protectors of the uh, holy sites of Mecca and Medina, their rivals, the um, the Persians, who are not uh, Arabs, by the way, but certainly our fellow Muslims, but Sun, but Shiites, not Sunni. The great rivalry there. There's a lot of, you know, this is a nasty neighborhood. By the way, I have to tell you this: this Hezbollah is in Turkey, and Hamas is in is, is right here, a little bit on the Israeli border. Jordan is, a, is, is, a, is as rickety as it comes. Syria, of course, is falling apart. Iraq is whatever Iraq is. God only knows. What that. Egypt is facing huge problems now because of the price of bread and grain uh, out coming out of Ukraine and uh, Russia, or no longer coming out of Ukraine and Russia, I should say. So they're going to be uh, further unstable. By the way, one of the things we don't see, this map is a bit dated. Um, there's a huge, what have I done here? God only knows. <clears throat> My mistake, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there's a huge gas industry here right off the Lebanese, Israeli, and uh, Egyptian coast that goes through Cyprus or will go through Cyprus and then through to Greece in an underwater gas pipeline. So we keep losing the sound, says Martin. How about now? We back in. My system indicates that I am. Uh, no long. I haven't. I'm, I'm not muted. So everybody hearing? I'm really sorry. I hope uh, we can do something about this. How's the sound, ladies and gentlemen? Need some feedback. Tell me if it's good, not good. I can hear fine. Okay. Good. Okay. Sounds like the problem's with you, Mark Martino. I'm sorry. All right. Great. Everybody can hear it. Back to business. So because of the coincidence of the source of all of these hydrocarbons being located in a place of great um, political instability, we have a, a very risky uh, supply situation. So oil supply is controlled by an international cartel, which, and by the way, cartels are illegal in most states in the world, but they operate freely in the global supply chain. Uh, that, and this itself is riven, the OPEC it's, is riven with cutthroat political and economic tensions. Um, if you think it's easy being the riding herd on the on the oil producers of the world, you're wrong. Very, very difficult. And we'll get into why that is in a moment. But um, the overall demand for crude worldwide is in a steep decline. And that is part of the problem. The total, <clears throat> the aggregate demand for oil is declining as we move into non-burning society. We live in a society that exists by burning things gas or oil or coal, our energy sources, our coolant, our electricity, our entire civilization is based on burning stuff. And uh, we're moving away from that because we're quickly choking ourselves to death. And hi, Bando. And um, so that means that the aggregate demand worldwide for oil is falling. And this gives the intra-cartel shoving a musical chairs-like edge. This old, as demand is, is, is reducing, the music is, is, is getting faster and they're removing the chairs and people have less market to sell into. So this creates huge problems to manage this cartel. Um, so let us continue. Here we go. Crude oil prices have fallen to levels prevailing. Now this is a bit dated, a little bit dated. It's obviously 53.90 now. It's, up. It's, it's well over, it's, 
it's up in the hundred dollar area, so it's come back. And again, I apologize for the for the um, for not updating this, but as I say, I just have been too busy, and I apologize. As you know, oil is is, is in the one hundred five area now, um, but <clears throat> for a long time it had been very low, and this has caused tremendous problems, tremendous problems for the cartel. We are of the opinion that they will uh, fall to levels not seen since two thousand eight, and very possibly during the nineteen eighties during the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, this isn't true at the moment because things have changed and um, oil is not likely to go below 100. It's not likely to go to 300 either. I've heard reports it's going to 150, 200. I, I don't think that's true and, and very few people I know do, although there are some voices that say it does. Now I'm gonna go over this quickly. I'm not gonna read everything. It's it's not as relevant as, as, it, as it would have been if we're just talking about oil. OPEC has an interesting history. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries was founded in the early 50s by the Shah of Iran, who was fed up with the abuse that was heaped upon the oil producers. They were, they were literally taken advantage of by the, by the Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters were the major oil companies of the world, particularly the U.S., but also British uh, Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, um, which, uh, which was, is also half uh, Dutch, half uh, British. Uh, you know, Standard Oil, which later became Exxon, Chevron, the, the giants, ENI, um, uh, Total. You you know those. You know the act. They were paying the they were paying the producing countries peanuts and keeping and, and and keeping most of the profits for themselves. Well, the Shah of Iran got fed up with this and decided that enough was enough and formed OPEC. And they over a very for a short period of time nationalized. Um, most of the oil, meaning that they made the oil their own property. Formerly, they it was they were just leasing the oil companies leased those grounds and gave a royalty to the nations from uh, upon, uh, upon whom uh, the uh, or under which the oil was uh, located. That changed. At that point, they nationalized it. They took the profits and they told the oil companies what they were going to get. Now the 19th uh, since the seven and and oh yes. Uh, with respect to o OPEC and um, their, their, their muscular power in the oil markets, um, they had tried many times to incur, impose an embargo, but failed. They couldn't really do it. They tried in 56, they tried in 67, in 73 they succeeded. So much so that they brought the Western world to its knees. It caused a huge recession, depending on how you measure it, that really didn't end till the early 80s. I mean, there are other factors involved there, but the inflation and the recession that was caused by the oil crisis of the 1970s, where oil had been $2.35 a barrel for decades, had suddenly shot up to, you know, $20, $10, $20, $25 a barrel. Oil, gas prices at the pumps all over the world were at unheard of levels, literally unprecedented levels, and it brought the world economy to its knees. Now, one of the problems with a cartel is cheating. In fact, that's not one. It is the singular most difficult problem to face. The idea of a cartel works only if by restricting collectively the supply uh, and uh, prices will rise, assuming demand stays stable, which at the time demand was enormous. Cars were grossly inefficient. Uh, the amount of oil it took to produce one unit of G one GDP of unit, unit of GDP in most countries was was about 10 times higher than it is today. We'll get to a chart that shows that in a little in a few moments. And so the role that crude oil played in, in, in industrial society was, was much greater than it is today. And the problem was, as it always is in a cartel, is cheating. If everybody is, 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 is allocated a, a production quota and prices are high, it's natural that they're going to sell more than their allocated quota to make more money. What eventually happens is that as supply grows, um, price falls. And it causes uh, instability in the cartel, not to mention oil markets writ large. So that's always been a problem for OPEC. In the 1990s, we have a body called OPEC Plus. The plus stands for Russia. And Russia, which is a huge, was a huge oil producer, but didn't was, was not part of OPEC, is now titularly part of OPEC, though not officially, and that's the plus. So it's R OPEC plus Russia, and together they all they they account for something like 50, over 60 percent of the world's oil production. 
Uh, so much the cheating will this is I ah, this is an important chart I want you to understand. Um, energy consumption. This, by the way, is in oil and gas. Energy consumption per dollar of GDP. So 1950, it's one. By 2020, it's less than 0.4. So in other words, it takes this. Uh, it takes it's 60 percent less oil per unit of GDP today than it was in 1950. That means, simply stated, that the world is 60% more efficient. Not only, it's way more than 60 because the GDP has gone up tremendously since 1950. The world is, let's call it 100% more efficient in the use of its energy resources than it was um, 70 years ago. And, and you know that, intu not intuitively, explicitly. Uh, car engines, you, you know, you, 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 they're more efficient. They're higher compression. It burns cleaner. With, with diesel burns cleaner. With, with power plants are more efficient. They're, all that efficiency adds up to this chart. This is good for us as consumers, but not good for us as um, oh, what's going on? I'm sorry, but not good for us as not good for the producing nations. It's a, and that's why, by the way, oil and gas. Producing nations are trying to diversify and, and succeeding, I might add. The Abu Dhabi, the Emirates, are seeking to become financial centers or 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 housing and commercial centers, or in the case of uh, the Emirates, travel and leisure uh, centers. Anything but energy, the, or, or even some of them are, are going into alternative. The Saudis are going to produce the largest hydrogen plant, green hydrogen, I might add, uh, in, on Earth. And that'll be up and running probably in another uh, five years. So they are working really hard, spending a lot of their hard-earned cash, transforming hard-earned cash from the from the energy sector and transforming it into either other sectors or the alternative energy sector. Um, this is this is the other half of the oil supply story around the world. So also, again, oil and gas. This is the shale world. These are the major shale deposits in the U.S. and they are producing pedal to the metal. There's a lot of oil here, and they're getting out. It's it's a gross, disgusting process. They have to inject high pressure, high temperature water with detergents added into it to force the oil out of a rock formation called shale, which is sort of like the cells in a sponge. It's forced up to the surface, has to be separated and cleansed. There's often byproducts of methane. It's a disgusting really awful toxic process but you know you, we need the oil so that's that's where a lot of the oil and gas that the united states produces come from um the the saudis definitely are seeking to crush the uh, shale oil industry that's clear um this is again this is uh this is still not uh, this is still out of date even though it goes to about 2021 it, because again, it's still short of where prices. I will go to the real charts in a moment, and these are the sources for today's uh, program. So let me just switch to some real time information so that we can um, go on, try to bring this up to date a bit. Alrighty, I want you to look at this. We're we're moving on to the gas supply situation in the world. Now, this complicated, rather confusing looking map is uh, incoming gas pipelines to Europe from Mother Russia. I want you to notice how many of them traverse Ukraine. Here's the outline for Ukraine in brown. Here's the Crimea that's already captured. It doesn't show the. I have other maps. I, I happen to be a map fanatic, and, and many people in our business are because it's, it, it's really one of the most powerful graphics ever invented. And it shows that a lot of this gas that goes into Europe flows right through the Ukraine. Keep in mind that up until 1989, 1990, the Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. It was dark green like Russia is. And, and, and so was everything you see up to about here where my mouse is moving. This was all, uh, including uh, here, the former Yugoslavia. This was all uh, the, the USSR, the Soviet Union. So. Now that the West has provoked 
Russia by uh, holding out the carrot to the Ukrainians of EU NATO membership, which in my opinion is exactly what has caused this European, this Ukraine war. The first time we've had international warfare on the European landmass since before most of us were born. I believe personally, and I don't want to get too uh, uh, editorial here, but I believe that the West is responsible. It's not, you know, Putin is not a madman. Putin did not. Yes, the Russian army is rotten, but they're effective. And he said, and there's a long history of this, and I'm just going to go over this briefly. It's my opinion that um, the, the, the Western world could have avoided this whole Ukraine problem if they paid attention in 2008 during the Bucharest conference when Putin made it clear that Western uh, membership by you into by Ukraine into the into the NATO uh, alliance was a red line. So he couldn't let that happen. It was viewed as a threat, and 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 the and the and, and the, the rub, as 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 Shakespeare would say, was that. Um, the United States then, even among all of the 21st century uh, leaders in the West who, who felt that, well, the Ukraine wants to be part of Europe and they're a free nation now and they could, you know, will help them, you know, really with total disregard to the actual realpolitik on the ground, which is what people who are crafting foreign policy have to be painfully aware of. They were of the opinion they were 21st century and no, it's benign. They want to be in the West. They want to be democratic. So we'll just let that happen and support them. and. And even encourage them as they're doing now, holding out the idea that well, if you want to break free, we'll help you. Well, not not so true. We'll send stinger and javelin missiles, but we're not sending flesh and blood to die by your side. And they say, and that's because they say it explicitly up till today, that Ukraine is not a strategically important asset for the West. What they should have done is let Ukraine be a, new, um, a buffer state, keep out of it. Let, this, let the Russians make understand that it's not going to be uh, the eastern front of the NATO alliance and leave it at that. But no, they didn't do that. And, and I believe that that's why we live, we're living in this hell right now in the Ukraine. But that's my opinion, and I could be wrong. Let's get back to the subject at hand. Gas supply, geo, geo, the geopolitics of gas supply in particular. Why gas? <clears throat> Europe and Russia have a gas-based relationship. In fact, Russia only uh, produces two things the world wants. Uh, weapons, which are second rate, but, but, but discount price to uh, Western weaponry, and, um, and natural resources, be they field crops like uh, corn or wheat, not corn so much, but wheat, uh, oats, uh, the, Russia, the, so the, the Ukrainians are the world's largest exporter of canola oil, rapeseed oil. Um, Russia also is the number one world exporter of wheat, believe it or not. Uh, but that's it. And of course, hydrocarbons. You, nobody has ever seen a Russian car, a Russian television set, a watch, a bag, an item of clothing, anything of any value. To, and nobody ever brags about some Russian accoutrement or, or, or accessory they own that's Russian. Because there aren't any. They just make weapons and natural resources. So they, and, and they do it in, in big time. So you see these pipelines going into Europe, and Europe has become utterly dependent on this Russian gas. To the great dismay of the of the West, the United States in particular, and this one, and we'll talk about. You see the Nord Stream pipe here. It should be a um, plan. It's the blue. Oh, here it's Nord Stream right there. Um, it's much, it's further, it's almost a year now. This, this is the, it doesn't have a, a date on it, but this is not so cool. The Nord Stream thing is done. The one, and that, that's the latest pipeline. Notice that it goes under the, um, under the Baltic Sea and it goes into Germany. The idea, and, and the, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the Western, particularly the United States, has warned Europe that they need to get off of the Russian gas uh, addiction because they will be manipulated ultimately by Russia. And they were right. Um, and they had argued strenuously, but ineffectively, to 
curtail the Nord Stream pipeline. And this is the rub that I want to bring before. The Nord Stream pipeline project is headed by Helmut Schmidt, the former German chancellor. And he, to this day, has refused to uh, 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 condone the attack in, in, in the Ukraine. He, he might agree with me, by the way. There are very few people that do agree with me on this subject. But some of them are pretty heavyweight kids. Stephen Cohen, Kissinger, um, Mearsheimer, a few heavyweights in the uh, international affairs world. Though they're heavyweights, they're a, they're, they're a tiny majority. Most of them hue to the Western line that it's, it, it's bald-faced aggression in the Ukraine and Russia is a monstrous country. And, and you know, without taking any consideration of the real politic involved and how the West is really uh, culpable, again, I, it's my opinion, but they're culpable in provoking the uh, Putin into doing what he's doing. But this is the gas supply network. It's slowly going to shut down. My opinion is, and, and, and you don't hear this too much, one of the objectives here is not only to deny the Ukraine to the Western alliance, but to redirect the flow of Russian hydrocarbons to, from the West to China. There are a couple of major pipelines that go from uh, the Siberian region into China, not many but there'll be more but and they're building some as we speak but i believe that that's part of parcel of what's going on one of the problems with this dependency on russian gas is i want to point out these stations these are liquid natural gas stations notice that there are no pipelines from these all these stations are on the western uh, coastline of um of uh, europe there are there is one in hamburg they're building more, the Germans are building two more. But you'll notice that the pipeline system is not connected to the LNG terminals. And gas pipelines are much harder to build, by the way, than oil pipelines. Oil pipelines are fairly easy, as long as they're sealed well enough and they don't leak so easily because oil crude oil is very viscous. Gas, on the other hand, is, 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 has to be airtight. And, um, and, and leaks in the gas system can be highly dangerous. So there are no pipelines connecting these uh, these uh, LNG terminals. So supply that does manage to get in here to supplement some of the Russian supply that's coming offline can't get to where it needs to go. So that's a huge problem as well. So the geopolitics of gas when it comes to Europe is unfortunately extremely complex and difficult. That's that's the essence of the problem when it comes to um, to gas geopolitics. So we see, we only see one, well, it's two plants here. There are more. I know that there's two planned in Germany, but they just put them on the drawing board since I think the outbreak of the war. So they're not on the map. Yeah. Um, so let's talk practicalities now. As traders, that's the background. We know what we're looking at geopolitically. Let's take a look at prices, all right? That's really, at the end of the day, we're traders, and that's what we have to look at. So here we see, uh, this is the uh, MT4 platform, and these are the uh, um, commodities we trade. This, of course, is natural gas. This, ladies and gentlemen, this is a daily chart, daily chart. This is the kind of chart that brings tears to a trader's eye. Why? because it's a beautiful trade. Now let me stop and digress by saying that those of you who may be thinking, well, isn't it horrible to be profiting from the misery taking place in the Ukraine? My pat answer to that is no. It's no less uh, morally um, uh, unacceptable to trade gas when the price goes up than it is to trade coffee when the price goes up because of meteorological reality. For example, those of you who the clients in the house, I know there are many of you attending today who are just uh, came by way of other sources, particularly investing. But those of you who have accounts with us know that we, for a long time, were pushing this. Coffee was a great trade. And that's because of complexities in the coffee plant as such. It's a, it's a, it's a very uh, temperamental plant. And meteorological conditions in the Arabica growing regions of South America, particularly Brazil, but also Colombia and Peru. 
yes, those, those, it, was a, it was a difficult situation. There was drought, there was frost, there was a real problem, but it drove prices up. Our job as traders is to take money out of the market, be it as a result of mother nature or human aggression. Our job is to take money out. Here is an opportunity to do so. Now, you think gas is going to go higher? Well, let's just look at the technicals here. It's above the 20 day, the 50 day, the 200 day moving average. Volume is increasing way above the average. The force index is well into positive territory. From a technical point of view, ladies and gentlemen, this is a good trade. We think gas is going to go up. Yeah, you bet. And I'll tell you why. They, the Russians, again, getting back to the geopolitics of the gas here. The Russians have already cut off supplies to Bulgaria and Poland. Now, one could argue that that's just an opening gambit. No, I, not one could argue, I argue that it's an opening gambit. The real target, of course, is Germany. 60% of Germany's gas comes from Russia. 10% of Poland's and, and probably about the same in Bulgaria. But Bulgaria and Poland are not major industrial powerhouses like Germany is. So. The percentage is, is relative. 10% in a country who's, 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 who's generally, who's, whose industrial output is a fraction of Germany's is not the same as 60% of a country whose industrial output leads the world. Germany is one of the top exporters of industrial manufactured goods on earth. So it's, uh, the, the Russian cutoff is a, is a gambit in, in, a, in a much larger chess game. And this pertains not only to gas, but is to oil as well. Now, even though we just saw earlier that um, uh, the demand for oil is slowing at all, this is this is this is crude oil. Brent, what did I say? It's, it's 111 now. I'm sorry. It's, it's an active day. It's 111. Demand on a, on a hugely rising volume. By the way, when we see volume rising, we call that sentiment or momentum. It means that when price rises or, or falls on low volume, there's not a lot of sentiment behind it. It's not a lot of momentum behind it. When price rises or falls on high volume, there's a lot of sentiment. Now, in this case, where we see volume moving in a range on high volume, there's a lot of battle between the bulls and the bears. And again, we see that. There are days where it goes down and days where it goes up. There's a lot of battling going on. But the long-term trend is up. And so the question is, will it, it's not whether it will get to 100 and, what is that, 130, 130 right there. The question is, when will it get to 130? Because it will. Why? Despite the overall aggregate demand for oil declining around the world, in the short term, supply of oil is, is di diminishing. This Russian oil cannot be purchased. Some of it is purchased on the black market. The Chinese buy a lot of black market. Like the Iranian oil has been forever under some sort of sanctioned regime. But it, it, they buy it. It's sold at a deep discount. Like the Russian oil will be sold to the Chinese at a deep discount. But it's not available to the major world consumers. Therefore, price will rise because supply is the declining. It's that simple. It's, you know, economics often is complicated. And, and, and it's beyond the mere simplicities. But this is a case where the mere simplicities largely explain exactly what we see on the chart. So oil is rising. Gas is rising. Um, and I think that pretty much is a great way to sum up today's presentation. It's, and, and, and I can sum it up. For, and, and so we can open up the floor to, uh, to questions, ladies and gentlemen. But let me just say in summary, what we have is a situation in the world where open warfare on the European landmass is, regardless of my two cents about why it happens or how it could have prevented, open warfare in the European landmass has curtailed the supply of, the, of major hydrocarbons, oil and gas. Because demand is not subsiding anytime soon and supply is contracting, only one option left, price rises, and price is rising. That's pretty much the whole story in a nutshell. We think it's going to continue. Those of, there are those who, who think, well, the war will be over soon. They'll, 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 they'll suit for peace. It'll come to an end. No, not at all. 
It's not going well. And, and, and anybody who thinks that, yes, the Russian rotten army is rotten and they're not good fighters and they're, they're corrupt and they're ill-equipped and they're, they're being mauled to death. Uh, I hasten to point out that, George, that uh, um, Ukraine is being dismantled city by city. We don't really hear too much about Ukrainian casualties. We hear about the 6.5, 6.8 million refugees that have fled the country, another 15 million who are internally displaced. Um, and it's, I don't believe it's Putin's objective to occupy the country or to take over the country or to, to, to uh, annex the country. His objective, and he's succeeding at it, is to make sure that the West does not move its eastern uh, border of NATO into the Ukraine. I don't think that's going to happen. The West is rushing to protect Latvia, and the, and the Finns and the, the Swedes are running to become NATO members. Let's, that, that's not what this is about. I don't think it's a good move. I don't think, by the way, that the Swedes or the Finns will be allowed into NATO because NATO, the way NATO works, is a uh, you, it has to be uh, you know, uh, unanimously accepted. And the Turks already are saying, no, thank you. We don't want the Swedes in. We don't want the Finns in. And I don't think that that's a bad thing because I don't think we need to provoke Putin any more than he's already provoked. He's not, he's not, didn't, he's not invading Finland. Didn't state he's going to invade Finland, but stated unequivocally more than 12 years ago and repeatedly and clearly and articulately that the West has no right, nor does he have any intention of allowing them to, to absorb the Ukraine, period. So I don't see that changing. I don't think this war is going to be ending anytime soon. All we have to do, in my opinion, to look for evidence of that position is to look at Grozny. Uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, places that the Russians, Chechnya, places that the Russians, yeah, they, they were also a sloppy, poor, poorly rotten army then too. But those wars did not, they, 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 Chechnya was, was virtually destroyed. They use that term, you'll hear that term being bombed into the Stone Age. Well, they were. And so I think we'll rest my case there. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Let's open the floor to some questions. No, I've thoroughly depressed you all. There's no, everybody is out cold, either crying or in a coma. Feel free. I'm sorry to be so depressive about this. I, I really am. But um, the geopolitics of oil and gas today is not a happy story. It's not like the OPEC story that I would have told a year ago, which is when that TPP was. Now, uh, Belima asks, or first Bogareth asks, is it too late to enter an oil trade? Absolutely not. It's never too late. Don't buy into that. The train has already left. It's too late business. There's always money to be made, especially where the trend is so prevalently and obviously clear. Um, what could bring the price of gas down in the next week, Belima? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, again, this, this, let's, let's look again. There's volatility here. In the last, in the, well, let's get a better chart. I like the empty pool because it gives me a collective view. But let's go to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, the trading view chart. If we go to natural gas, we get, by the way, it's a trading view, the best available charting platform on the internet. Um, you know, this is a weekly chart. Let's drill down to it daily. Again, the same chart. Um, a lot of volatility. If we take a look at, say, the last, say exactly, if you go from uh, 6th of May until today, the 18th of May, I mean, 17th, it's gone down uh, over a little over 8%. Oh, it, oh, it's gone down 8% since then. That, But from here to here, we just run the film back a little bit from here, here it fell 17 percent and that's in two days so can it go down yes it can believe it. but when when you ask that question it implies that you buy here and you sell here okay or you sell here and i'm sorry you sell here and you buy here but leaving out that possibility that possibility was only a, a window of two days more open the long-term trade is a 
long-term trend is up. So you want to buy in the long term here. Again, ladies and gentlemen, let me state clearly that there's risk here. Um, not everything we say and all the signals we send out, I, I lose plenty of money like everybody else in this business. You can't make money in this business without losing. And I and I dare say any competitive endeavor, be it sports, be it trading in the capital markets, you have to know how to lose in order to win. We all lose. Everybody loses. If you are playing with money, if you're trading with money that you cannot afford to lose, I suggest you leave immediately. You've got to be prepared to lose money here in order to make money. Because lose, you will. We all do. But the sine qua non of success in this business is making more than you lose. And so if you can do that, you're a success. But lose, you will. And so understand that quite clear. Um, so in terms of Belima's question, what could bring the price of gas down? Mere volatility. Volatility accounts for this kind of movement. But still, look at the trend. The trends are... It, it, Dips below the 20 day moving average. Okay, it popped right above the 20 day moving average. So, none of these are what you'd call uh, strong e exponential moving average uh, indicators of a trend reversal or, or a correction. Uh, Ushabab asks kindly, what is the strongest support level for natural gas to draw the stop loss below? And uh, I have buy trades uh, short. Nine. Let's take a look. He's got five. He's short at 8.9. Well, it's currently 8.3. So, ah, so the support line. Well, you can tell from this, I would say this is a support line. Six, six, nine. Let's call it six, nine, nine. That's clearly a support line. Below that, you'd say six, four, six, nine. Sort of a little bit, and again, I'm going. He's by this indicator, by the way, is volume on price. This tells you how much trading is taking place volume wise on the price level. This, supposes, this of course, is volume on time, and that's a great indicator. And, and by the way, I, I do have a, a premium account for trading view, and this is the reason I get this indicator, but it's not necessary. Uh, you can live without this indicator and, and see these um, support lines without it. This is just a little crutch. This is the, uh, the point of control, meaning the, the most sales took place at this price in this data set, which goes back to October of 2021. Most of the sales took place at, excuse me, five, a little under 4.9. 4 and we can see that because it's way, price is way above the 200 day moving average. So that's the strongest support level. Hope I've answered your question, Mushaba. If not, uh, re-ask it out, and I'll try to be more uh, more uh, articulate, specific. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? If there are none, and I'll let you formulate your questions, just let me say a couple of things before we end up. First of all, uh, for those of you who are uh, members of the house, clients of the house, you know, you, you you know that this is the kind of quality work we put out for our people. We send signals. We have ebooks and, 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 and video briefings. We have a wide selection of tools and and, and, and aids that we provide our clients. And for those of you who are attending and are considering opening a, a, a trading account, an online trading account, please consider opening up with Elbex. So we do our best. We're stand-up brokers. We're up front. We, we, we don't make money all the time. Let me make that clear. We lose like everybody else, but we do our best for our clients. And this is really, um, you know, uh, the, the, the essence of uh, our, our, our ethos as brokers. And so I want you to feel free to, to, to open up an account and, and, and see what we can do for you. I also want to ask you that uh, to, to, there's a poll and a survey at the end of this session. Please fill it out. Let us know so we can improve. Let us know what you thought about today's presentation, et cetera. And finally, let me remind you that next Thursday, we have a, uh, a session. Um, and I'll tell you the title of that in a minute. My diary does not make that clear, but I can tell you. Just one second. Let me look it up. Um, Thursday, the 26th. Yes, that's price action trading. And uh, not as daunting as it sounds. That's our subject 
for uh, the 26th. Price action trading, not as daunting. It's not, all price action trading means is how do you trade based on the movement of price? That may seem intuitive. It may seem daunting. I want to dispel uh, certainly the daunting part and show you how to trade according to the movement. Uh, is it recorded and can we replay later, asks uh, Mushaba. Absolutely. Uh, you'll get the recorded session in about an hour or two. Uh, you'll get a link to it uh, in your inbox. My pleasure, Mushaba. It really was. Um, thank you all for your uh, interaction, your dialogue. It made it very interesting for me. Good luck in London. Thank you very much, uh, Bogareff. I'll do my best. I'm going to give two presentations. We'll have a booth. Anybody who's in London uh, on this Saturday, please feel free to drop in. I'm happy to meet you all. and. Um, It'll be it'll be worthwhile. It's a good show. It's a it's it's a major show. This, uh, last time I looked, there were seven thousand people planning to attend. So it's a big show. There's a lot of exhibitors. It's a very very interesting uh, uh, conference. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, uh, Cesar, thank you. Also, great Mushaba. Thank you all very much. Those, those compliments that mean a great deal to me. I really appreciate it. So on behalf of the staff, the management here, ladies and gentlemen, at uh, Elbexo, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're always. We're proud and very humbled by your patronage of us as your online broker, and therefore I am your host, Seth Julian, wishing you all, ladies and gentlemen, the ability to trade with confidence. Bye bye for now. My pleasure. Well, thank you for joining us.